I want to say thank you so much for being here. I am thrilled to welcome you to the first ever White House Foster Care and Technology Hackathon. Yeah. It's almost unbelievable that this is our last uh, foster care month during the Obama administration, so we are going to make today count. Um, today's event is also made possible um, because of the hard work of a number of people, and I want to take a moment to recognize this group of people who care deeply about our nation's foster care system and want to improve the lives of those who are a part of it. So before anything today, I want to give a big thanks to Commissioner Rafael Lopez over there in the corner. He and his team over at HHS, which includes Jenny Wood and Kurt Heisler, thank you so much for all that you've done. This would not be possible. None of you guys would be here. We wouldn't be here without you, so big thank you. Um, thank you to the inspirational Sixto Cancel and his whole team at Think of Us. Uh, I want to give a shout out to our hackathon masterminds and leaders, Eric Miley from the Annie Casey Foundation. Where are we at? There you are. <laughs> um, and also uh, Pooja Balachander, Wendy Harmon, and Emily Ayanakone, Ayanakone, there we go, um, from the Presidential Innovation Fellows. Um, superheroes do exist and they're called PIFs, so let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> And I also want to thank uh, Winnie Wexler from the Pritzker Foster Care Initiative and Angela Vigil from Baker and McKenzie for all of your hard work uh, that you've done to make today success. So a big round of applause for this team. So today's event feels like it's been a long time coming. I remember over a year ago um, sitting down with Rafael and Sixto and talking about the needs in child welfare and how they aren't being connected with technology. And there was such an opportunity gap there. And we started talking about what can we do to try and bridge that gap. Um, and since that day, we've been working on that exact question. Um, we've been trying to do more with uh, the technology that we have and create new systems that weren't in place before. So thank you everyone for being here today. It really warms my heart that this has come to fruition, that you're all here. Uh, it's really unbelievable to look out at this room and, and see this wonderful community. Um, so now it's my honor to introduce my boss, Roy L. Austin Jr., who serves as the Deputy Assistant to the President for Urban Affairs, Justice, and Opportunity. Uh, Roy is fighting to make our nation a more fair and just place filled with more opportunities. So let's give up for Roy. Good morning. Uh, that's weak. Good morning. Good morning. This is an awesome day, and uh, I am so glad that you are here at the White House for this. And um, let me be very clear, for the last three years, the person fighting most for foster care and foster youth in the White House is Molly Dillon, the person who started off. So a big hand for Molly Dillon. Now, you're all here during a, a very special month. As you, as you know, this is uh, National Foster Care Month, and it's a time when we reflect and think about the young people who spend time in care and the selfless men and women who embrace the children in our foster care system. It is also a time when we recommit to helping more children find safety and permanency. Since his first day in office, President Obama has been fighting so that no matter where a child is from, what that child looks like, who that child loves, and what their circumstances are, that every child can reach their highest potential. This month, we celebrate the current and former foster, foster youth who are absolutely crushing it, okay? who are succeeding and who are leading. But we also know that for other young people who experience foster care, they often face a tough road. Young people who age out of foster care without a permanent home are often at higher risk of entering the criminal justice system and they face greater challenges to completing their education, obtaining high quality health care, and securing gainful employment and a safe place to live. Former foster youth have very significant rates of post-traumatic stress. Now we also know about the dangers of congregate care and that kids are better off when raised by loving families and not institutions. That's why the President's budget included a proposal to limit the use of group homes 
and push for more family-based care. At the heart of America's success are families who've stepped up and sometimes stepped in to provide love and support to vulnerable children and youth. And part of that push for family-based care is kinship care. We know that one in 11 of all children and one in five African-American children will live within a kinship family sometime during their childhood. Kinship care, when safe and available, provides the best opportunity to retain family connections and the child's cultural heritage and community ties. We need to fight so that all, and I mean all loving families, kinship or otherwise, that want to open their homes to foster youth uh, includes adults with disabilities and LGBT individuals. And we need to make sure that the child welfare system is operating in the 21st century. Technology has brought so much good to our lives, but often we have found that the child welfare system has not synced with the advances in technology. We use our phones and tablets to call a cab, to order a pizza, to send photos to friends, and even to check and track, well, for some of you, your exercise habits, um, and some of you, your sleep habits. Uh, there's no reason why we can't use existing technology to build new apps and programs to better serve youth in care and the adults in their lives, and even prevent young people from entering care in the first place. This is why I am excited to announce brand new steps from the administration that were released today. Now, for the first time in 23 years, the Department of Health and Human Services issued new regulations that guide the use of technology in child welfare. So the, child, the Comprehensive Child Welfare Information Systems final rule promotes innovation and allows states and county child welfare agencies to use technology more effectively to quickly identify youth and family needs and link them to services. Additionally, the regulations promote the exchange of information between child welfare agencies, healthcare facilities, education systems, and courts to better serve young people in and aging out of care. Now, HHS has also teamed up with the General Services Administration, GSA, to provide $1 million worth of consulting to states as they procure agile child welfare data systems. In In addition, the Department of Education today released a toolkit for young people aging out of the foster care system, providing much needed resources to help foster youth ac access and navigate social, emotional, educational, educational skills and resource barriers as they transition into adulthood. And the Department of Labor has launched Get My Future a mobile-friendly web app for youth to plan careers, explore education, and training options, and search and apply for jobs. It also provides special resources to help young people meet challenges such as involvement in the foster care and juvenile justice systems, homelessness, addiction, or a lack of financial, family, or community resources. Now, we also have some exciting announcements from our friends in the private and nonprofit sectors. So let me have uh, the folks who worked on laptops please stand. Okay, no, on, on this, so on, on a special project here. So the Walter S. Johnson Foundation, stay standing. The Walter S. Johnson Foundation and Foster Care Counts and a public-private coalition led by the state of California have committed $250,000 to launch an effort to ensure that all transition age foster youth in California are provided with free laptops. So. Now this coalition aims to distribute 10,000 laptops to foster youth aged 16 to 21 at an estimated cost of over $5 million over the next three years. Thank you so much. Pritzker, could those involved in the Pritzker project please stand? All right. 
Now, the Pritzker Foster Care Initiative has pledged $1 million for our Foster Care Technology Innovation Fund to boost nonprofit entrepreneurial efforts targeted to supporting transition age youth 18 to 24 years of age who are in the foster care system. Grants will be made to nonprofit organizations developing innovative online solutions and mobile apps that meet the unique needs of youth in foster care. The fund will encourage public private partners to boost tech investments in child welfare. Thank you very much. And Salesforce, please stand. Who is here? Excellent. So Salesforce is going to create a prototype within the next 90 days to model a modern day case management system scalable by interested foster care service providers. Salesforce will make the prototype and code that runs on Salesforce available to interested stakeholders. Thank you very much. So as of this moment, we have 239 days to get something done in this administration, which is not a lot of time. But over the last seven years, we have accomplished a lot. And this is why I'm thrilled that all of you are here today. It's not just a moment, this is a movement. You are here today to help us carry this work forward because with your help we can revolutionize foster care systems, create better futures for all children, and make this country a better and stronger nation. And with that, I want to introduce my very, very good friend, Commissioner Lopez. Uh, Raph, let me just, sorry. I'll let you clap for him soon. Uh, now, Commissioner Lopez, uh, he, I, I got a chance to know him when he was working here in the White House before he, he abandoned us and went over to HHS. Uh, this guy is a fighter in every way, shape, and form. There is nothing that if he puts his heart to it is not going to get done. And this is what he did here at the White House, and he moved so many initiatives here, uh, and his passion is child welfare. And so uh, with that, let me pass it on to Commissioner Lopez. Thank you, Roy. Good morning, everyone. So welcome to everybody who is here in the White House and to all of our friends and family watching us live uh, across the world. Um, we are so thrilled to have you here this morning. And I'm curious, by a show of hands, how many of you are here at the White House for the first time ever? Raise your hands. So there are actually a lot, exactly. Yes, clap for that, yes. A lot of people are here for the first time. And I wanna take a moment to sort of ground us, not just in walking us through the agenda for today and tomorrow, but sort of the importance of what it means to raise your hand and say I'm at the White House for the first time. So you're in a building, the Exec Eisenhower Executive Office Building that was once the home of the Department of War, of the Department of uh, Navy, and Department of State, right? And so in these halls has walked, you know, presidents and prime ministers. Uh, negotiated agreements have happened between Martin Luther King Jr. and President Johnson uh, in the rooms around us. There are fossils on the floor as you walk around this building. When you exit and you go to the, and you see the West Wing and you see the Vice President's Office and Vice President's Office and the Chief of Staff face this building and you know that just steps from that is the President's Oval Office, it squarely grounds us in the moment and time we have in this history. And you are part of that history. Every one of your names is part of the presidential record because everyone who walks through these gates is part of history. And you are gathered here today because you're trying to flip the script on what's happening in foster care in America. And we are so grateful that you're joining us here today. We want to um, take a moment to ground us, not just in understanding why you're here and the agenda, but uh, dive a little bit deeper before we get into the panel discussions about um, squarely grounding us in the data and what the data tells us about what is and what is not working in child welfare in America today. So first of, all, first of all, May is not only National Foster Care Month, it is also Teen Pregnancy Prevention Month. And one could ask ourselves, well, what do those two have to do with each other, right? But actually, it has a lot to do with each other. And those who work in this field know this quite well, which is that these months are often designed to lift up and increase awareness of important national issues like foster care and teen pregnancy prevention. We often wear ribbons, many of us are wearing ribbons today, right? But oftentimes the month ends, the ribbons come off and you go to the next thing, right? Next ribbon, next issue. And one has to ask ourselves, what do we do in building a movement that lasts beyond wearing the ribbon for that month? And how do we engage across multiple sectors the kind of talent and creativity that we need to sort of really rethink and reimagine foster care in America? 
For example, we know that youth in foster care are two times more likely to become pregnant by age 19 than other youth. Mm -hmm. That is a fact. Um, we know that their prospects, whether you are a young parent as a teen or a young person in foster care, their prospects for graduating from high school greatly diminish when they enter the foster care system. Um, the chances of getting into and through college are diminished with roughly two to four percent of all former foster youth attaining a bachelor's degree, two to four percent in America. We know that these kinds of data points aren't simply obscure numbers on an Excel spreadsheet or in our systems. They are the stories of American young people. They are the stories of people in this room today that have survived and have thrived in spite of the child welfare system. They are people who have aged out of that system. They are joined today in this room by judges, mm -hmm. social workers, teachers, nonprofit professionals, coders, engineers, lawyers, all trying to rethink how to flip the script on this data. We know that a California study of youth who were homeless in San Francisco found that 25% of the street youth had become homeless on their most recent separation from foster care, a group home, or juvenile detention. And our own Family Youth and Services Bureau recently released a first-of-its-kind study on our street outreach program for young people who are living on the streets. And what did we learn? We learned a couple of things which won't be a surprise to a lot of the young people who have been in the system, which is that more than half of homeless youth become homeless for the first time because they're asked to leave home by a parent or caregiver. And more than half say they have tried to stay at a shelter, but it was full. And those findings resulted from a study released April 12th by the Department of Health and Human Services Administration for Chil on Children, Youth, and Families. And in that, we learned even more information, again, which may not be a surprise to many of you in this field, which is that the average youth spent nearly two years living on the street. How is that acceptable for our young people in this country? That more than 60% were raped, beaten up, robbed, or otherwise assaulted. That nearly 30% of participants identified as gay, lesbian, or bisexual, and nearly 7% identified as transgender. And about half of the youth had been in foster care. They had been in foster care. So by no fault of their own did our young people end up there and then homeless on the street with no place to go. How is that an acceptable understanding of the data that we see over and over and over by these studies. And as the president has said when he launched My Brother's Keeper several years ago, he said, how is it that we've become numb to these statistics? How is it that this has become part of the American narrative? And he says, no, we do not have to accept that. We can change the script. Yes, we can do things differently in this country. And in 2010, states began to opt into providing foster care until the age of 21 with federal re reimbursement. Roy lifted up the fact that the president has repeatedly submitted in the budget proposal a way to deeply invest in prevention to make sure that young people never have to ultimately end up in foster care if we actually provided them and their families and their neighborhoods and their communities with the right kind of preventative support when they need it, when they need that help not when actually the crisis happens, which is the way in which our, 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 our current child welfare system functions. The President's budget has called for expanding this to 23, to making sure more young people have a transition to adulthood in a way that honors them, because what young person at 18 or 21 completely had it figured out? I didn't. I can't imagine many of you did. And for those of you who have children like myself, is that good enough for you to have it all figured out by 18 or 21? I think the answer is no. It just doesn't make sense. We also know that it doesn't have to be this way anymore. And today is part of changing that narrative. Why you are gathered here from all over the country, from our friends in Utah, who I see in the corner over there, to our friends in Connecticut or New York, to our friends in California or the state of Illinois and everywhere else in between, to all the different people from different sectors, to our social workers who accompanied many of folks um, from our team on a ride along in DC recently, these are all change makers. You are all change makers trying to change this narrative. And we want to think about it in the context of what might happen if. What might happen if today your contribution to the conversation today and over the course of the next 24 hours to the hackathon will dramatically change everything we do in child welfare? What if that's possible? Some of you are already shrugging. But what if that was actually possible? What if we actually believed that what we have now has never worked? And it's worth actually trying something dramatically different because we spend billions of dollars a year on a system that we know does not yield better results for the young people and the families who are touched by the system. That said, we know that we want to change the rules of engagement at every level. And as Roy announced, one of the things we're doing is around the comprehensive child welfare information system. And we want to take a moment to ground your thinking and your thoughts about this. For those of you who want to nerd out a bit, it's called CCWIS by its acronym. 
For those who are in the field, it's also been called SACWIS, or the State Automated Child Welfare Information System. For those of you who know nothing about these acronyms, let me break it down to you in a very different way, which is that it is the one way the federal government is able to understand at the child level what is happening to kids who enter our system and how that information is tracked. When were they removed from family? Were they placed in a foster home? Were they actually ever adopted? What happened when they languished in care many years? How do you coordinate their care from a medical home to the courts to the educational system? All these pieces working together are part of the new CCWIS system and ultimately it's about changing the way we work with all of you in the country. We want to make sure that we are being much more responsive to the needs of states and counties and tribes. We want to make sure that we understand and are supporting agile procurement and agile development and rapid prototyping in the child welfare space in a way that it's never been done before and that the federal government will help partner with you and help cover those costs because it's been 23 years, nearly a quarter century, since we released any kind of serious guidance on this issue. That's not to assign blame to anybody, it's actually about years of struggle to get that through. And today we stand on the shoulders of many, many both career staff and political appointees over many administrations who've tried to change the script on that. We stand on, on all of your shoulders. And so in our phones that we carry, we have thousands of apps that help us track you know, that Rafael's putting pepperoni on his pizza, right? But why is it that we can track that or a package at your doorstep within 24 hours on Amazon Prime or order jewelry or figure out how to customize your car online, but we can't tell you for a fact right now exactly where every child in America who's in the child welfare system is. We can't do that right now. That is the truth. And the fact is, is that that is unacceptable because you all now know this information. You know the data. You know the fact that we can do things differently. What about bringing the tinkers and the makers and the entrepreneurs and the hackers and the engineers to this space? We do know that we want to create amazing apps that help us play games and help us engage and understand the weather. That is fantastic. But what about that talent in this space over and over and over so that a young person who is on the street can use their phone, which by the way, they often have, and this is the way in which they engage to find a bed to sleep in that night, to find a mentor, to find a home, to find someone who's actually going to say, I love you because you are extraordinary and you are powerful and you're beautiful just the way you are. And changing that narrative is just as important. So we want to make sure that we help better coordinate services, eliminate redundancies in the existing systems, improve data quality, and ultimately help us achieve better results for the children, youth, and families we serve. We know that CC was as imperfect as it even may be today as this is announced, that it will promote data sharing across agencies in a way that we've never even been able to do. Will it happen tomorrow? It will not. It will take time to change those systems across the country. We know that it will require quality data. Why is it that we have to assume that data has to be so poor? Because most of our social workers spend most of their time filling out forms and paperwork. We're joined today by two social workers from DC, Tabitha and Tamara, who actually, when we talk with them on a ride along, they not only confirm, but we know it's across the country, they'd rather spend their time doing prevention and helping those families get and connect to the services they need, improve the data quality, instead of writing down everything by hand. What if their reports were transcribed from their voices into Word and automatically loaded up into, in, into systems? Think about the shift that would have. The technology exists in other sectors. It does not right now in child welfare, and we know we can do better. Yes, we can do better. We also know that CCWIS will reduce the mandatory functional requirements and ultimately allow agencies to build systems tailored to their needs on the ground. And what that really means at the end of the day is making sure that we are responsive to what's happening across the country in a way that makes sense for your community. We can't do a one-size-fits-all for everybody. We know that. And we know that technology and innovation are tools. They can help us transform the space in a way that we never imagined. A few months ago, the president said at South by Southwest that he has been trying to bring a different kind of level of innovation to the federal government and making sure that people across our country aren't so frustrated by engaging with the government, right? And doing things like changing FAFSA, the financial aid forms, so that young people can more rapidly access and fill out their forms dramatically reducing the red tape there. Is it perfect yet? Not so much, but dramatically improved. Huge increase in the amount of young people who are using FAFSA. Second, he talked about making sure that applying for Social Security online was possible. 
one of the most basic functions, social security online, reducing the red tape to become a citizen in this country and doing that online so that people who are trying to go to college or better their lives or become a citizen of this great country are able to do those things much more rapidly in the 21st century and why that matters so much. The second thing the president talked about was embracing new technologies that allow us to do things in a very different way and to tackle big, big problems in this country in completely new ways. And ultimately, it's part of his legacy because he is the first president that has had command of and use of multiple tools in a way that no president has ever had. From Snapchat to Tumblr to Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, it's the first time as a country we've seen this rallied and harnessed from the federal government and the White House in a brand new way. Why shouldn't child welfare be the same thing? What might happen if we harnessed all of those new technologies and all of that in a very different way? What if? What might happen? What might be your contribution today? And as the president said recently at a Howard University commencement, he encouraged the graduates to think a lot about what happens when you struggle and things are hard. And for every single one of you here, whether you are a coder, an engineer, or a social worker, you know that you encounter challenges every single day. And you've got to work through solutions no matter the cost because you are so dedicated to that work. And the president said to the graduates, and I want to lift up exactly what he said, um, he said, and when your journey seems too hard and when you run into a chorus of cynics who tell you that you're being foolish to keep believing or that you can't do something or that you should just give up or you should just settle, you might say to yourself a little phrase that I've found handy the last eight years, yes, we can. <laughs> and the same thing applies to you and the next 24 hours. Whatever your sector, whatever your field, whatever your point of view, whether you even know what hackathon means, Dive in. Say, yes, we can. Yes, I can understand this. When the chorus of cynics tells you over the course of the next 24 hours or in you, you feel that grumbling that it's not possible to change things, that we can't reimagine child welfare in America, or that we can't flip the script and build a different way of doing things, you're going to say, yes, we can. When at 2 o'clock in the morning, the teams that are hacking, that you'll hear from in a few minutes, when they're sort of really tired and not sure how to get through this, they're going to say, yes, we can. And at the end of the day, you will leave this White House today and tomorrow as ambassadors of the movement that Roy is talking about, that is embodied in the extraordinary um, energy and creativity of people like Sixto Council, and the way in which this will be carried on beyond this administration, because it's not about just President Obama's administration. It's about each of you and the children, youth, and families you represent and the ways in which you're connected to these stories. So bottom line, you are here to help fuel that movement. And now I'm going to walk you through the course of the agenda before we turn to our next panel. We are going to next move towards um, talking about developing digital solutions for foster youth, families, and service providers by a series of folks that I'll introduce momentarily and really sort of lift up where they've encountered those challenges and how they've worked through them to try to innovate in a very difficult space. We will then move on to um, legal challenges and talking about how to rethink how the law is used to support and break down barriers in servicing young people across this country. We'll then lift up what's happening around the hackathons and dive into that. And I want to lift up for those that are not going to be with us um, in person through the whole time, we'll then move to the Ronald Reagan Center. We'll actually do have a series of multiple tracks, one just for those interested in the law, lawyers and advocates and policymakers thinking about how do we use the law differently. We're going to dive far deeper into the nuts and bolts of CCWIS and the Comprehensive Child Welfare Information System for those of you from state systems and others to understand better how this will work. We'll also have teams that are literally hacking. And if you've never actually done this before or are curious, just go. Ask questions, engage, because the product is about iteration and going back over and over and rethinking these ideas and ideating and failing and succeeding together. So that's the course of the next afternoon. We'll come back to the White House tomorrow where we will actually then hear back what happened over the course of the evening and what innovation has happened and what they've created in 24 hours. Will it be perfect or solved? It will not be. But it's meant to model the fact that in every single thing we've lifted up, change is possible. That it's actually possible to rethink how we run these systems. And then we'll actually conclude uh, tomorrow afternoon. So with that framing of the day, we are grateful to all of you that are here. We are grateful for all that you do now on behalf of the nation's children, youth, and families. And we are grateful for what you will continue to do moving forward.